And uh, let's do it. I want to have some fun today. So let's talk about a framework that I call the reply method. So I'm a really firm believer that spam, the only place that that belongs is over a bowl of white rice with an over easy egg. It does not belong in your prospects inboxes. So what I want to talk to you about today is how to avoid being a spammer. All right. The problem that we have when it comes to cold email in particular, and I'd love to hear from you in the chat how this compares. And as I'm going today, if you have questions, please drop them in the Q&A. So if you aren't familiar with Zoom or haven't used Zoom much, there's a Q&A button there at the bottom. Just click on that. You can drop your question and I'll try to get to as many as I can. But I'd love to see how this compares to your cold email reply rates. So drop in the chat for me. This is data from Clearbit. I see this really similar across sales teams that I work with too. A less than 1% chance to get a reply to your cold emails. Drop your cold email reply rate into the chat. We'll do our best not to shame you if it's so if it's if it's bad, I won't make fun of you, okay? Don't be don't be afraid to share it. So I'm seeing a lot of less than 1%. Yeah, 5%, 2 to 3%. 5 yeah, maybe five to 7%, five. Yeah, a lot of ones and twos. Natalie just crushing it, 11%. Anything in double digits, honestly, is really good. Uh, assuming that about half of those are positive replies, anything in double digits is great. Noel gets 40%, love it. Okay. And what I always like to you know kind of joke about is statistically, if your email reply rates are you know, lower than 16.6%, .6%, you have a higher chance of getting food poisoning, you know, this year. So I don't know about you, those are not favorable odds. I don't want to have to send out a hundred emails to get a response, especially if you're personalizing, you see how like fucking work that is. I'm going to drop the occasional F-bomb today too, by the way, because this top topic gets me pretty fired up. So hopefully we don't offend too many people, but um, that's a lot of work to send out an email. All right. So let's talk about why this is happening. So one, you blend in too much. So what I see consistently across the board, these are emails that get forwarded over to me. If you see Sarah in there, that's my wife. We used to run our business together. So her old emails get forwarded to me now, but I'm seeing a lot of stuff like this. What do you guys pick up about this? What do you guys see, good or bad? Look at the subject lines, the first lines of the email. Help me out in the chat here. What do you, what do you like or dislike about this? It's all very generic. High name, all clearly sales emails, lots of questions, very long. Yeah, long subject lines, basic offers. <laughs> no rice or eggs, Kenton says. Yeah, Landon says it's salesy as fuck. <laughs> Your word's not mine, Landon. Uh, lots of eyes in the first line. Right, They blend in. So that's problem number one, is we blend in too much. Uh, number two is what you might be thinking about is, well, you know, I got to be creative, right? All the people on LinkedIn tell me that I need to be more creative with my emails and I need to personalize them. And, you know, people are using GIFs and videos, and all this other kind of stuff. Well, you know, creativity has a cost. That cost is time and energy. The more creative that you try to be in every single email that you send, the more energy it's going to suck away from doing something else. What you could be doing on a cold call what you could be doing in a discovery call, a deal that you could be closing. And it might take up more time than you have bandwidth for. And I don't know about you, I have a lot of experience copywriting and creating, you know, I do most of the marketing for our business, but I, I was never formally trained in copywriting. So I was never taught how to actually write really well. So being concise and all of that stuff that you see really great writers that are good at, economy of words, we call it, that probably doesn't come naturally to you if you weren't trained on copywriting. So here's the opportunity. And what I want to focus our time on today. Uh, one, you can actually stick out and pop through the clutter if you just simply talk more about the prospect than you do about yourself. I'm going to share a framework. We're going to talk about how to create your own templates today. I'm going to show you how to do this. So if we just talk more about the other person instead of ourselves, that's a really easy way to stick out. The other thing that we're going to talk about is creativity in simplicity. So whether you use an iPhone or an Android, there really isn't any debating that iPhones are easier to use and they're better. Okay. Just to talk a little shit to you Android users. <laughs> 
but there's really isn't a lot of debating that an iPhone is, is very simple to use. Whether you use an Android or not, it's pretty easy to pick up an iPhone and figure out how to use it. And when Steve Jobs made the announcement about the iPhone and how it was, you know, touchscreen and all of this other stuff, that seemed really cool at the time, right? I got a smartphone. I can listen to music, look on the internet, do all of this stuff at the same time. But in reality, it, it, it was really innovative, but it was also very simple and intuitive to understand. He didn't have to over explain what the iPhone was. And people look at that as creativity because it's so simple. Right, so creativity comes from simplicity in most cases. And then lastly, what we're gonna talk about is you don't need to be a professional copywriter to write good emails. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is if you can write like you talk, one of the biggest hacks that I have for cold emails is a couple things. Write cold email templates when you're creating them, write them together with another person. So get another rep on your team or your manager, or as a team, you can do it and take turns and have someone explain out loud as they're writing the email so you can talk it out. The other hack that I have too is if you create the cold call talk track before you create the cold email, just take the same language that you would use talking about it. That's a really easy way to simplify it. Yeah, Madison says, I like writing emails on my phone and then send them from my laptop to keep my words minimal. So one of the things that you could do too is voice memos or anything that will transcribe what you're saying. I like to just start talking about what I'm gonna say, record it, I can look at the transcription and I can copy paste. So you don't need to be a world-class copywriter to write good emails. Write like you talk, talk out loud, and we're gonna talk about how to do that. So there's three key ideas today and then we're gonna get to the good stuff here. So one, I'm a high, uh, a big proponent of templates but not templates that you find on LinkedIn or on websites or from podcasts or whatever it might be. I'm a really big fan of templates that you create. So we're gonna talk about how to create your own template. The second thing that we're gonna do is talk about how to repurpose existing content. So one trick that a lot of marketers use when they're posting content, I do the same thing. So many of you probably found me on LinkedIn or on a podcast or, or maybe a webinar. I don't come up with new content every time I talk about the reply method. I might come up with new stories and different ways of teaching it, but the base root of what I'm about to talk to you about today, I've repurposed into different LinkedIn posts, into videos. I talk about it on podcasts, webinars. The content's already there. I just talk about it in different ways. You can do the same exact thing with your email. You can literally create an email and I'm gonna show you how to create two or three variations of that same email using some of the same language. And then lastly, when in doubt, err on the side of being boring and obvious. So what I mean by boring and obvious is I'm gonna show you what I call boring subject lines. And you're gonna be really underwhelmed at how easy it is to get a 40 to 50 plus percent open rate by just using a one to three word subject line that is so insanely obvious what it's about that the prospect, like they don't do any thinking with it. So that's what we wanna talk about today. Okay, cool. So key idea number one, Ken, templates that you create. We're gonna repurpose existing content. And then when in doubt, I'm gonna show you how to err on the side of being boring and obvious. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna run you through two frameworks. So one is gonna be a messaging matrix. And let me know in the chat, uh, just give me a yes. Who here caught the webinar I did a couple weeks ago on messaging matrix. Give me a yes in the chat because I'm going to review that. That's at the foundation for everything that we're going to talk about today. Okay, quite a few people. I'm going to give you guys a, a way that you can check out the replay because that part's going to be really important to creating your own emails. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the rundown of this framework and then I'm going to show you an example of what this actually looks like. And it's a sort of a uh, fictitious example, I guess you could call it, that's loosely based on some uh, clients that I've worked with. So the first thing that we need to do before we ever create a template, yeah, I'll send it out, Landon, so that you guys can check it out. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna get a really good understanding of the path that our prospects are on. Because whether you like to admit it or not, your prospect is actually already like they're doing business on a regular basis and they're doing it without you and they're probably getting along okay for the most part, all right? So what we need to understand first when we're talking to prospects is if we look at this graph, we have 
time here on this side, and then we have results here. So what I want you guys to do, help me out in the chat. Let's work on one persona together, okay? So give me one job title of a prospect that you want to focus your cold emails around. So we got finance, controllers, CISO, CMOs, directors of marketing. Cool. All good. All good so far. Okay. So what I want you to do is think about two things, all right? So every prospect that you reach out to, we're gonna think independent of your solution. I don't want us to talk about our solution at all in this exercise. That's kind of the key to the email too, is to not really talk about what you do. We're gonna talk about them. So this is that first thing that I talked about with the peacock and the picture in the background is more you, less, or uh, more them, less you, right? So what we need to do is two things. We need to be crystal clear on their priorities and their current solution, okay? So priorities and current solution. I'm gonna show you guys an example of what this looks like here in a second. So basically what we need to do is if we're reaching out to, you know, if I'm Isabel, chief procurement officers, salespeople's worst nightmares, <laughs> uh, chief procurement officers, I need to understand priorities. What are these people trying to accomplish on a daily basis? So think about, you know, it's 2022, C-levels, VPs, think about what are the big things, what are the big initiatives that they have to complete this year, right? What are those really big things, okay? And then how are they getting it done right now? And again, I'm gonna show you an example of what this looks like. I just wanna get your heads thinking right now, okay? So what I'd love some help from you in with the chat here is what is a current priority of the prospect that you listed? And then what are they doing to get the job done right now? Help me out in the chat. And I'll give you some examples here in, the, in a second, but I just wanna see kind of where everyone's skill level is at here. Yeah, so Chelsea says increased digital engagement, they're pushing app downloads. So think about the current solution that they're using. Are they using a, comp a competitive solution? Are they doing it themselves? Are they using a particular strategy or tactic that is maybe outdated? Let me know in the chat. Yeah, Melissa says reducing budget costs by using a competitive solution. Cool. Yeah, doing more with less, Jeff Thompson says. Dealing with lack of help, labor or lack of, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, building a curriculum to fall with state standards, Patrick says. If they do have a solution, they're having unqualified teachers implement. Okay, Patrick's got a really good one. All right, and I'm going to repost Patrick's in there. That's a really good one. Okay, so once we know current state, what we need to do is a couple of things. And essentially... This high level understanding, again, I'm gonna show you an example of what this looks like in a messaging matrix, but by doing this upfront, you actually give yourself the swipe copy that you would put into a cold email, all right? So what we need to understand now is problems. So as they go through time here, you can see that people experience ups and downs. What are some of those downs? And then what we need to understand is what are some of those aspirations? So what are some of the things that they want, you know, six to 12 months out? So help me out in the chat here. We have the priority, the current solution. Let's start with problems first. What are some of the things that get in the way? So Alexa said acquiring new customers. What are some of the things that get in the way of them acquiring new customers? Donna said, need to increase audience engagement. What are some of the things that get in the way of them doing that? What are things that get in the way, Dale, of them streamlining inventory and optimizing food costs? Uh, James, you got a really good one. James Lee, establish best markets to expand into. Their current solution is manual research into local regulations and market sizing. Why is that problematic? Why is that not ideal? 
I'm going to write some of these down because they're good examples to use here. So help me out in the chat. What are some of those problems? Yeah, Lydia says, how do you engage people who aren't on social media? Patrick's got a really good one there again. Budget, not enough teachers. Brittany Tucker, you got some really good ones too. You guys are killing it today. Perfect. Okay. One more thing I want to ask you now is aspirations. So let's think about what these people want to accomplish six, 12 plus months down the road. And again, I know we haven't talked about an email yet, you guys. Okay. I know we haven't talked about a cold email or a template or anything like that. This right here will give you the language for the email so you can create a customized template. So if you're feeling a little bit like uh, impatient right now, it's all good. All right. This is the information that if we create it in advance, we can literally repurpose this for cold emails. We can repurpose it for cold calls. Okay. So this part's really important that we do up front. So let's think aspirations right here, six to 12 months out. What am I thinking about? What am I trying to accomplish? Yeah, Patrick says high proficiency scores. Dude, Patrick, you're on fire today, man. I, I have enough here that we can actually write some emails with. So we might use you as an example, actually. Um, yeah, killer stuff, you guys. Yeah, efficient social media plan. What do they want from that plan, Jonathan? That's what I would think about. So with aspirations, you guys think outcomes. What are the ideal outcomes? What's happening? What are they accomplishing? Okay, good so far. All right, so here's what I wanna show you. Let me open this up on my other screen here. Okay. All right, I'm gonna share this document with you towards the end of the call, okay? So you, everyone will get access to this. All right, so what I wanna show you is here's an example of what a good messaging matrix looks like. So let me zoom in. Again, I'm gonna share this document with you afterwards, and there's a whole training, a free training that you can check out on building a messaging matrix. But I wanna give you guys an example of what a good one looks like. So this would be an example of someone that's selling into a VP of human resources and they're selling some sort of either recruiting, staffing, or it might be software that helps them do this themselves. So what do you guys notice about how detailed the priorities are and about how they're written? So this is employee satisfaction or productivity. How do we take care of existing employees to increase our workplace ranking retention? What do you guys notice just about the priority statement here about how it's written, the level of detail that's there? Yeah, Timothy, few words in bold and an explanation. So it, I'm really dropping in a category or a topic, okay? And that's super important to give really quick context. So we, you guys notice how it's written in first person from the perspective of the prospect? And again, the really cool part about this, is we're gonna talk about email today, but a month ago I talked about cold calling. You know, with cold calling, what's really cool is these are literally the priority drops that I would use at the beginning of a cold call. Hey, can I get 30 seconds to tell you the reason why I'm calling? And you can let me know if you wanna keep chatting. Yeah, go ahead, Jason, what's up? Um, the reason I was calling you is that I talked to a lot of VPs of human resources right now, and I keep hearing one of two things. Uh, one, a focus around employee satisfaction and productivity. So how do we take care of existing employees to increase our workplace ranking retention? And then two, I'm hearing a lot around the speed and cost of hiring. So how do we improve our hiring practices to increase the speed of hiring and lower the cost of acquiring those hires? Which one of those two things is a bigger focus for you right now? Boom, right? I got a talk track. And we're gonna talk about how to turn this into an email here in a second too. So yeah, they're open-ended questions. It's prospect focus, it's nice and short. Okay, Blair, you said something that's really important. They're broad, big picture problems. They're broad, yet kind of specific at the same time. So here's the broad category, and it's how do we 
employ this tactic or strategy. That's It's something that your prospect is already doing to get this result or outcome or fix this big problem. So it's specifically worded in this way. And I'll talk to you again about how this connects in a second. Isaac said, if we should talk how we should write how we talk, then our email should sound similar calls. Yes, exactly. Introspective. Okay. So this is the messaging matrix. So basically what we've done here is that's the first big hurdle is you need to come up with the messaging. I'll send this out afterwards. So you'll get to see this example. I'll make sure that you have the recording for the messaging matrix. That's step number one. Without that, your emails are just going to be super shitty because they're going to be so bland and generic and you're going to take a long time to write. So that's the first thing. Okay. So what I want to get to now is let's start looking at emails. And specifically what I want to do is break down a couple of emails and then I'll talk about how to take that messaging matrix and turn it in to an email. I want to check in with everyone. How's everyone doing out there? You guys getting some value so far? Give me a yes in the chat. If you're getting some value, I want to make sure everyone's awake. <laughs> we good. These webinars are always weird because I can't see you, but you can see me. Okay, cool. So let me share my screen and let's dig into this part. Okay. So what we're going to do is I want to break down some cold emails. I've blurred out the prospect's information and their company name. So the goal here, it's not to shame anyone. It's to just show you guys what you're competing against when you cold email people. And these are emails that I have personally received. Okay. So what I want to do is go through this email. Let me ask you here in the chat, what do you guys like or dislike about this email? The subject line that's blurred out, by the way, is the name of their company. Yeah, so it's short, it's brief. Yeah, Brittany says, I don't like that it starts with a video about them. Ends with a question, no talk. Yeah, Isabel, you said the same thing. Yeah, focuses on solutions and not problems, James says. Yeah, my company doesn't do cold calling. Megan, we'll get back to yours. Yeah, it starts out talking about them. Okay, it's very me focused. That's my big feedback. It's so me focused that the name of their company is the subject line. <laughs> it's the entire focus of the email. There is nothing personalized about this email either. You can't see because I blurted out the thumbnail for the video, but it didn't have anything with my logo on it, my LinkedIn background, my website, nothing. There's nothing to me that indicates that this email was specifically for me. And it leads with their solution. Yeah, this is the first email, Patrick. So the video, which I won't play, is all about them too. It's literally a run through of all of their services. So it's all the things that they can do for my sales team, which they clearly didn't research me either because I don't have a sales team. <laughs> so I give them a yellow. The, sub, the call to action is not terrible, but I give them a yellow because it's, not, it's, it's, it's clearly not for me because I don't have a sales team. So how are you currently driving key behaviors from your salespeople? All right, let's take another look at an email. All right. So what do you guys think about this email? Good or bad? It's a very long, very long subject line too. You know, I kind of gave this part away too, but the subject line is disingenuous too. It's got the RE in the front and it was the first email that I received from them. So the average reading speed of a college educated adult, at least in America, is 250 words per minute. Uh, this is about 300 words, if I remember correctly. It's at least 250. So if the average person reads at 250 words per minute, do you think your prospect is going to spend an entire minute reading an email from someone they don't know? No, they're probably not going to spend more than five or 10 seconds. So the email is not skimmable. Yeah, it totally looks bad on mobile. So let's break this email down a little bit. So decent empathy in the email. I give it a yellow. We know you're constantly trying to find a balance between providing your service and running a business. We work with a lot of marketers like you. The reason why I give this a yellow is that, you know, that's something that I do juggle as a, as a coach and trainer running a small business is I got to deliver the service and run the business and market and sell, but I'm not a marketer. That's not how I talk about myself. That wouldn't be the word I would use to describe myself. It might be one word that I would use to describe a part of me. That's not how I identify. 
let's look at the next part. Yeah, Isaac said the TLDR should be at the top. And by the way, I know what TLDR means because I have a Reddit account and they use that a lot, but pros most prospects are probably not going to know what TLDR means. But they literally could cut out the entire part that talks about how their product works. They could cut this out. You just don't need this. I've never talked to you before. One rule that I would really ascribe to, if that's a word, is don't prospect to make a sale, prospect to start a conversation. So in our emails, they need to help us start a conversation with a prospect. The way that we start a conversation through emails is by getting a reply. It doesn't even have to be to book a meeting. We don't have to make that the call to action of the email, but we can cut out this entire process right there, that entire middle part. Like the entire email could have been just this TLDR piece and maybe a mixture of the top part. This could have been two or three sentences. And I'll show you how we do that here in a second. And stop asking people if they want a demo. No one wants a demo. The call to action here is also not formulated as a question. That's a really big thing too. Okay, let's look at this email. What do you guys like or dislike about this email? Let me know in the chat. What do you like or dislike about this email? So this is a rep that sells a CRM solution to multi, multi-family uh, properties. So the part that's blurred out in the subject line is the name of their company. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah, Hubert, I, I know that the love thing is a pet peeve. You know, I, I think that people make, I say, hey, I'd love to schedule some next steps with you. I say that all the time. I don't know. Some people think you shouldn't say that. I think it's more of a personal preference than anything. But you guys, this, this, this email landed a meeting. So this landed a meeting. And it's not perfect. Clearly the email is not perfect, but let's talk about some of the things that work about this email. Cause I want to get you guys on the same page with what works. Cause this, this email worked really well. Okay. So subject line is using what's called rule of three. So budget, vacant unit, and then threw in the company name. So the budget and vacant unit, these are things that are top of mind for these folks. And it's personalized. It's not only personalized, but it's connected to why he is reaching out. Saw on your website newsfeed that you recently welcomed this new company into your portfolio. That's what they care about most. Yeah, the Davlin is a hyperlink to the case study, which we'll talk about here in a second. I'm hearing from other marketers, other marketing directors that this is a point. This is the thing that his customers always talk about. They're trying to reduce the number of days their units stay vacant but they aren't sure which sources will help them do that the fastest. I'd we'll love to share more stories about what's working well for your industry peers like these people. Exactly, Brittany. Interested in chatting further. So could this email be better? Yeah, I probably would, if I was grading this email on a scale of one to 10, I'd probably give it a, maybe a 7.9. It's good enough to get responses. Could you make this more creative and I mean, honestly, this email is under 120 words, by the way. So could we make it a little sharper? Yeah, we could. We could do all of those things, but it doesn't have to be perfect when you get a lot of the core messaging in there. What I want you guys to focus on with the emails is more about will this message resonate with this prospect and less about writing the perfect email. Here's another example of an email. Personalized, this company sells consulting services. And one of their types of clients is breweries and people that, you know, kind of, you know, have these, you know, manu people that manufacture, you know, type of things or people that have some sort of um, space where they're making their own products and there's a lot of waste and utility costs with that. But this also landed a meeting, the same type of email. By the way, the only thing that people are customizing on these emails is the first paragraph. And again, this email is maybe longer than it needed to be. But the language, this is exactly what they hear from prospects. And Fred asked, is it possible to adapt these ideas for mass email campaigns when personalization is limited to using the first name and the greeting? 
yes, it's possible, Fred, but the approach that I teach is not based on something that you can just send a thousand emails to the same person. But if you're selling a solution that's, you know, less than seven, eight, nine grand a year for a, a prospect, you don't, you probably shouldn't customize it a lot. You don't really have time, you know, to do that. But yeah, I would love to share with you what other brewers are doing to reduce their expenses in these areas. Interested in talking further. This just this type of email right here just lands meetings all day with them. So what I want you to be aware of is just because you see certain things on LinkedIn or even me sharing things or webinars or books or whatever, you got to try stuff. And there's a lot of information out there that people like myself share that's totally personal preference. The would love to, that's an example of something that's personal preference. There are people that are strong against that and there are people that like say it doesn't matter and both of them get great results. So try not to focus on little things like that. Focus on the core of the message, okay? And that's what I wanna share with you next, all right? So let's talk about the reply method framework, and then I'm gonna show you how you can use this to create your email templates with, okay? So let's break this down. And by the way, as we're breaking this down, you don't need to follow this format perfectly. Think of this more as like a checklist of things that your email needs. I'm using this example to show you how an email could be formatted, but I'm gonna show you a couple variations that it doesn't have to be formatted like this, okay? So please, please use this as a checklist and a guideline. It's not meant to be followed in perfect order. So reply is an acronym. So the R stands for relevant results. So relevant results is any type of social proof or case studies. It could be also something that you talk about that's related to the aspirations of the prospect. So my email needs to have some sort of social proof around other companies that we've worked with that are similar, case studies maybe that I can share, results that I've gotten for the prospect. That's the first part, relevant results. Uh, I do recommend against links, Lisa. You said, are links bad in a first email? Will it get flagged and go into spam? If you're doing any type of enterprise outreach where you're reaching out to companies that are, you know, even a thousand plus employees, I wouldn't put a link in the first email because it's more likely to go to spam. Uh, Clement, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Same, same for images, GIFs, and emojis. Don't use any of that stuff in your first email. And know your audience too. They may not relate to that type of stuff either. So relevant results, that's the first one. The E stands for empathy. So what I need to make sure to talk about is the prospect's priorities and any problems that might get in the way. Land in, definitely. That applies to the meeting link. Don't share a meeting link in your first email. I would recommend against that. <laughs> Landon says, fuck. <laughs> um, it's not the end of the world. Just just stop doing it moving forward. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so empathy, uh, prior priorities and problems. So the next piece is P. It's for personalization. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. But with your personalization, what I like to do is focus on, here, let me write this up here. Where I like to focus the personalization is on the prospect's values. So I do that in one of three areas. One is education. So I look for content that the prospect or their company makes to educate their customer base. So that's the webinars they put out, the blog posts, the articles, that might be the prospect being interviewed on a podcast, whatever it might be. We have accomplishments. So think about with this, what does your prospect or their company brag about? So for example, I showed you an example of a VP of HR and the two priorities that we talked about were, uh, one of them was around increasing the employee engagement and satisfaction in the workplace. So I'm gonna look for evidence of signs that they actually give a shit about that. So that would be company awards, any social posts that talk about the company culture, Glassdoor ratings and reviews, 
whatever it might be. All right. So accomplishments. And then the third one is investments. So investments are, where is this company investing? So that could be hiring, mergers, acquisitions, new products, new services, et cetera. So Yulia said, um, having a meeting link in their signature has been super useful. Those who don't wanna use it, don't. Those who do have super easy access to a conversation, yeah. So if you're gonna use a meeting link in the first email, I would make sure it's in the email signature. And you guys, I'm a really big proponent of what works. So if you have something you do that works and it doesn't burn out your market or make you look unprofessional in any sort of way, just keep using it. I'm a fan of what works. So relevant results, E for empathy, P for personalization. These other two are a little bit more general guidelines. So laser focus. I really want my emails to be less than 120 words. Ideally, I'm somewhere in the 80 to 20 word range. Yeah, Chris, links in the signature do apply to this. It's not perfect, but I would, in the first email, try to use a signature that doesn't have any links in it. And then in the follow-up emails, you can change the signature if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, good point. 80 to 100, sorry. 80 to 100 is what I've seen the range be. And sorry, you guys, I'm getting distracted with looking at the chat here. I need to focus a little more. So... Less than 120 words for sure is max, but I've seen the sweet spot 80 to 100 words is a pretty good sweet spot. Okay, and then lastly, we have why, which is you oriented. So here, what you need to do is make the prospect the hero. So what I always like to say is that no one wants to be Alfred, they want to be Batman. So a lot of times when we talk to prospects, we come in like we're going to save the day, right? We t come in talking about how our solution's awesome, we're the greatest all for all these reasons, and we position ourselves as a superhero, as Batman. Um, but your prospects want to be Batman. They want to be the hero, right? So we need to talk about how we can be Alfred, right? How we can support them in what they're doing. Okay, cool. Relevant results, empathy, personalization, laser focus, you oriented. That's the reply method. And again, we're gonna use this as a guideline for what to do. So let's look at some more examples. Uh, let me open this up here and then I'll share my screen again. Okay, cool. Yeah, you bet, Brittany. Molly, cool. Okay, so here's what we do. And if we have some time, I actually might work an email out based on what some of you guys have shared into the chat too. So we take this messaging matrix and what we can do, and I'm gonna flip back and forth between these a couple times. What we can do is take this template and I'll drop it into the chat. And by the way, you don't need to use this word for word. This is just a way to get the email started. My big tip with emails when you're writing them is done is better than perfect. Do not edit the email as you're writing it. I'm, I'm writing a book right now on Outbound that should be coming out Q3. The plan is to hopefully get it out in July. Uh, best case scenario of June. You know what's really hard about writing that book is that most of what I'm putting down is absolute garbage, <laughs> okay? I'm thinking about all the work that it's gonna create for me later to edit this thing and to work with an editor. That's just a part of the process because I won't make progress on that book unless I just continue writing and putting the ideas down, knowing that I can trim the, the fat away. With this, when you're writing emails, same sort of thing. It's gonna feel like garbage when you write these emails at first. You can always trim the fat away, okay? So this template, is a very good way to get started, okay? And I'll show you how people use the template. So again, I'll flip back and forth between these two. And actually, let me open them up side by side. That actually might be a better way to look at this. All right, so here's the email. All right, so again, this email works, I know, because we've used it and we get lots of responses with it. 
All right. Yep, I'll be sending out the document, you guys. All right. Yep. Yeah, a lot of you guys are asking about the document. I'll send it out afterwards. Okay, I'm going to share it with you on the on the call today too. So, okay. So here's how we got from point A to point B. All right. Do you see the template here? So saw that. I'm going to point out something that these people value. And then maybe I'll add another sentence for context. They know that people that really care about the speed and cost of hiring are putting bonuses and on-demand pay and, and all kinds of stuff into the job ads. So that's the thing that they point out first. That's your personalization, the P. And this got me thinking about priority drop. Do you see how we just reworked the priority drop statement for this paragraph? Speed and cost of hiring. How do we improve our hiring practices to increase the speed of hiring and lower the cost of acquisition? It's got me thinking about how you plan on increasing the speed of hiring, or reducing the cost of acquisition. Folks, I'm hearing from many VPs of HR in a similar position. And look here, we just drop in some social proof, similar companies. Pepsi and Whole Foods are using a help too. And you can throw in the aspiration or the specific result, which if we scroll over, they want to improve their hiring process to never run into labor bottlenecks ever again. That was the big thing that they highlighted. Every prospect that they talked to kept complaining about labor bottlenecks and how they want to get out of the labor bottleneck that they're in right now. Pepsi and Whole Foods are using our help to avoid labor bottlenecks by keeping hiring costs down and hiring timelines short. So they're using our help to accomplish this by getting rid of this problem. The problems are right here. All right. It's labor intensive to do this ourselves. Timelines to hire are long. You can see that I just adapted that just slightly. Can I get an opportunity to share how this could be helpful for you at your company? These are the subject lines. I'm going to talk about subject lines here in a second. So I just want to pause here. What are you guys noticing? And again, I want to comment that this email could be edited more. It totally could be. We might be able to actually combine both of these into one paragraph and one sentence. We could do that. All right. That's 108 words right there. We could get that down to 80 words if we want. We could totally do that. But this email gets responses and we could edit more. Okay. All right. So what I want to ask you is what are you taking away so far about how you can connect the dots between your messaging matrix and this and the emails that you're coming up with? How are you connecting the dots? I want to make sure that this skill maybe is not being fully transferred to you because you haven't gotten a chance to practice yet. I want to, I want to make sure that you're connecting the dots of how you can apply this with your own prospecting. What are you taking away? So far, I want to make sure that you're seeing how we got from point A to point B here. Yeah, Kenton says, I'll be able to make a lot of different emails quickly. Yeah, subject lines are problems. We'll talk about subject lines here in a second, Alexa. Yeah, less is more, know your prospect. Yeah, Todd, great example. Todd said, is the word curious okay to use versus this got me thinking? Dude, totally. Say, so, hey, uh, I'm curious how you plan on increasing the speed of hiring, or reducing the cost of acquisition. A focus I'm hearing from many people like you. Yeah, it is really funny, Yulia. Yep, so Isabel shows you know them and their priorities, but it's scalable, social proof. Shorter can be more effective. Um, yeah, Kabir, it's kind of like the spin concept. Yeah, a little bit. Yes, cool. So you guys are sort of connecting the dots here, right? Now, what's really cool too, is that this same email, what we can do, that's pretty badass, is we can rework this email into something shorter. So I, what I have an example of here is these emails that I call short and C-suite cold emails. So it's a play on words, right? Instead of short and sweet, short and C-suite, get it? <laughs> A little cheesy, but um, what you can do with these emails is repurpose what you wrote before and just put it in a different order, make it shorter, etc. No, I'm not a dad yet, Andrew, but I definitely have a lot of dad uh, dad jokes and, and dad humor for sure. 
Um, so what we can do here is here's the template. And again, I'll be sharing this document with you here in a couple minutes. I saw that here's the personalization, same line, right? Can I get an opportunity to share how companies are doing this thing without this problem? Like this is literally what it looks like. Same subject line kind of things. Hey, Andy, you saw that you're offering a thousand dollar signing bonus, on-demand pay and retention bonuses for the positions you're hiring for right now. Can I get an opportunity to share how Pepsi and Whole Foods are reducing their time to hire from about three weeks to two, three days to avoid running the labor bottle? Dude, that's it. That's the email. With your sequences, you need to send a person like five or six emails over the course of your sequence. This two emails right there, you created one email and you can work a second email into there, no problem. And then you could throw it in any thoughts bump email if you want. Like that's it. You don't need to recreate the wheel every time you can repurpose this language. Okay. So Kabir, you said, how does it tie into ICPs? You have to be a little bit more specific with your question, Kabir. Yep. You could easily use the same thing for a talk track too, Sam. So what I might do to add links, Molly, is maybe the second email, what I could do here is I could say, can I share a case study of how Pepsi and Whole Foods are reducing their time to hire from this? So instead of dropping the link for the case study in the email, I send an email and just ask them if they'd like to check out the case study. And guess what? I got a template for that too. It's the case study template. And here's what that looks like. And I made up the names here. So if you have really good case studies, you can say, hey, Jason, so-and-so, CHRO at Whole Foods shared how they decreased their time to hire from three weeks to two to three days. We could sharpen this up a little bit. We could say to avoid uh, labor bottlenecks. Can I send over the case study so you can see how? And I throw the, the personalization to the PS. Saw that you're offering a thousand dollar signing bonus. I thought you might find this helpful. Pretty cool, right? These get really good responses too. And then when the person responds and says, yes, in the case study, I, I like to pick up the phone and call them. Hey, Kevin, you responded to my email about the case study with Whole Foods and how they decreased their time to hire from three weeks to two or three days. That ring a bell? Yeah, well, I figured I'd pick up the phone and call you real quick and you know, kind of do this the old fashioned way. Before I send that case study over, it's not totally self-explanatory. Would it be cool if we unpack it maybe later today or tomorrow when you're free? You got your calendar handy? So this is the way that you can identify hand raisers. Who's engaging with your stuff, right? Um, okay, there's a lot of questions in here. I wanna see if I'll have time for a few of these, but I wanna talk to you guys about subject lines real quick. There's different variations in this document of call to actions too. So I like soft versus hard call to actions. Gong has a lot of data around how it can be much more effective to ask for interest in a call to action versus asking for the meeting. I found that to be personally true with the client work that I do as well. So there's different ways that you can end your email here. But for subject lines, again, I call them boring subject lines. I just wanna pick out a two or three word subject line that talks about bits and pieces of what I talked about in the email. So for example, Patrick, what I wrote down for you, the priority was how do we build a curriculum that falls within state standards? The problem that they have is they have a solution, but they're getting unqualified teachers implementing because they um, lack budget, right? So the problem is budget, not enough teachers, unqualified teachers, not enough time to learn new technology, implementing new tech efficiently with students. Dude, you know your subject line could just be curriculum. It could be state standards. This might be a little, <laughs> little dicey to use unqualified teachers as a subject line. Um, not enough teachers, lack of teachers, right? Um, ELLs students exiting the EL status. I'm not sure what that means. I know ESL English is a second language. Oh, English language learners. Okay. So. Yeah, EL status could be a subject line. Uh, Molly, you said close achievement gaps as the subject line. You could do that, but I like to talk about stuff that's a little bit more general that doesn't talk about how we help 
necessarily directly. So instead of close achievement gaps, what if it was achievement gaps? Right? So that's just an example, Patrick, of what you could do. I mean, when you look at the priority statement here, let's just look at the template. We don't have enough time to like work this out right now. Oops. Let me do this. So if we kind of look at your deal here, you could mention something about the school standards or something off their website or their school's website or whatever it might be. It's got me thinking about how you plan on, uh, you know, building and revamping your curriculum so that it falls within the new state standards. Focus I'm hearing from many so-and-sos right now. Uh, schools like our school districts like A and B are using our help too. Um, get high proficiency scores in their state assessments by avoiding budgetary constraints or running into the issues where they don't have enough teachers and not enough of teachers or unqualified teachers. Can I get an opportunity to share this could be helpful for you at ABC, whatever, right? Um, you kind of get, Patrick, that if we spent a little bit more time on this, you would have a lot of really good, you know, kind of copy paste things that you could use in here. And that's your email right there. It's as simple as that. So what I want to really make sure that we do is really kind of simplify the process here, okay? So let me share this document with you. Um, per usual, just want to put it out there as well. We do have a program called Outbound Squad. So if you're if you're reading this or watching this and you're like, dude, I'd love some extra help with this or get some extra coaching or a community of people also doing this or coursework to like really help you nail this faster so you don't have to do it all by yourself. Outbound Squad is a program you can check out. So there's more details. I'm not going to talk about it a ton here, but it's application only. On the last page of this document, there's a little bit more about it and how you can apply. Yes, it's definitely with me. So I'm the, uh, me and Ethan Parker do all of the coaching in Outbound Squad. So I'm going to drop this link into here. Check this out. Make sure you download your own copy. So go to file, make a copy. If you don't use Google Drive, or Google Apps, you can download a Word version of this, whatever you gotta do, make sure to save it before we take off. And I'm gonna look through the Q&A here to see if there's anyone's questions that I can help answer. Yeah, Rodney said, rule of thumb for optimum max number of words in a cold prospecting email. We already talked about that. Less than 120 words, ideally 80 to 100. It's kind of a good range. Um, okay. Eric, you said, should email keep that? I hope the find this this finds you well open or not. No, dude, <laughs> don't do that, please. I hope this finds you well is how 90% of people start their emails. Start the email how I suggested. Start with something about them. Hey, noticed your, saw that, your post, your initiative on this, the award you won on this, whatever it might be. That's a really good way to stick out. Um, let's see who else has got some questions. Okay, Eric asked, does the layout pattern, the F-shaped email matter? Yes and no. I think if you're writing a longer email, that F-shape is going to matter a little bit more. But you can see it's not really relevant when you write a short and C-suite email. Like, dude, it's pretty short. You know, it's pretty short. So I guess it does kind of follow an F. But yeah, I would definitely, definitely do that for sure. Um... Okay, let me look and see what else we have here. All right, so Vincent asked about subject lines. Take a look at the boring subject line section in that document and you'll get some help there. Uh, James, yeah, you said, can I get an opportunity? Feels a little bit like I'm positioning myself below them, not on their level. What do you think about that? I think James, you should use whatever you want. So if you don't want to say, can I get an opportunity? And you want to say something like, um, can I get a shot or Hey, would it be valuable if I shared how companies like X, Y, and Z are doing this dude, any variation of that is fine for you. Um, I really want you guys to make sure that you don't like overly focus on the specific wording that I'm using and more the framework, because the framework is going to help you apply context for your prospects. So Dan S asks, what if there's a little depersonalized for some prospects? Dude, look on the company website. 
It doesn't have to be something about the individual person. This is something I talked to our group in Outbound Squad about today. I was doing a lesson on personalization at scale. So in Outbound Squad, we do really in-depth trainings of like what we just covered today. We'll do a whole you know 90 minute training just on personalization. And I think a realization that the group had was that when you personalize, it doesn't have to be something unique to the individual. A lot of the people you're reaching out to don't have a LinkedIn profile or they don't post content or there's nothing online about them. That's okay. <laughs> it could be something that related to your uh, the problems and priorities that they have based on stuff that you found on the company website or in company news. It doesn't have to be something to the individual. All right. Okay. Cool. I'm going to drop the link to this document again. We are out of time. Appreciate everyone's engagement today. I hope today was really valuable for you. Um, appreciate you all, you know, kind of showing up and spending an hour with me. This is super fun. I love doing these webinars. So if you're looking for some extra help, definitely check out Outbound Squad in that document. Be happy to put you in touch with Ethan to tell you a little bit more about the program and, you know, all of that kind of good stuff. And just uh, keep trucking. Let's get some shit done the rest of this week. All right. We'll see ya. Later, everyone.